The perfect diet? The perfect diet for gym rats at least. Essential nutrients you're probably not getting. So, the supposed perfect diet, well, says who? Well, says me. But joking aside, you will learn something from this video regardless. It'll give you some practical takeaways to implement into your current diet. Now that little snippet you're seeing there, certificate of completion, that was a little science of nutrition course I did from the Clean Health Institute. It's like a sort of personal trainer type thing, like mini little course here in Australia. This one was taught by Lane Norton. If any of you in the fitness industry know who he is, you'll know he really knows his stuff. So that's just one specific nutrition related sort of training that I've had. I've had a few others, but I thought I'd just put that there. It helps add to my like credibility, you could say. So just real quick, the macronutrients, we've got protein, fats, and carbs. Protein, one gram per pound of body weight, one gram of protein per centimeter of height. And we have about approximately 20 grams plus of protein per meal, four to five times a day. If you have about 20 grams of decent quality protein, you get 90% of the muscle protein synthesis response from your meals. But if you have 40 grams, then you get 100%. But this is only if you're like really hardcore into the bodybuilding scene. Like if you're a general gym rat, you don't really need to worry about this. It's just something that you should note. Plus 40 grams of protein is kind of, it's kind of a lot in just to get in each single meal. So as for fats, around 0.35 grams per kilo of body weight is usually a good bare minimum. If you go any lower, you tend to sort of start running into some health issues. Like for me, when I was getting super lean, anytime I went below this, I'd have a lot of trouble sleeping. So yeah, don't really go below this. And then the rest of your calories can be made up with carbohydrates. The image on the right is a little snippet from a video I've posted before. If you want more information on the macronutrients, go and check out that video. We're not going to go into it much more here because this is stuff you probably haven't heard of. You more than likely have heard of the whole protein, fats and carbs thing. So more info on the basic stuff is found in that video you're seeing there. So yeah, what you probably aren't aware of are the macronutrients, which we're going to go over in this video vitamins and minerals which is you know the general healthy shit that no one really seems to care about now i'm going to tell you why they're important and how eating these can translate into better gym performance so you might be wondering what's with that gamification of life sort of social media plug and the gamification social media plugs at the bottom there i find it adds a little bit of pizzazz to these slides so it becomes less like a lecture I also got the general idea of, I guess, Brian Jung and the Maverick of Wall Street where they have like a little slide that has like an outline of a few things that just helps add a bit of razzle dazzle. And also, I've split up the two sort of side hustles because I find that there's a certain audience of people that only really care about career and like money and finance. And then there's a certain segment that only really cares about gym, which is why there's like two separate sort of, I guess, brand names. This is especially noticeable I found on Instagram in particular. Like there's a lot of like stock related pages that I follow and they will like my stock related posts and shit. And then Gains Vacation, a lot of like gym people will follow that and like my gym specific well they're all gym posts but like i will scroll through my feed on gains vacation it's strictly just gym stuff and i will have only gym rats really follow me there and as for gamification of life it's a lot of like finance people like stock market people just stuff like that like some people just don't care about the other thing like a lot of i i'd argue pretty much 95 percent of the followers on gains vacation don't give a shit about stocks or finance or career or anything and then most of the followers on gamification of life only really want to know juicy stock tidbits and just the stock market in general they don't really care about gym so that's why i've split the two and the reason they're down there well again it's to add pizzazz but it takes me a lot of effort to sort of whip up a video as you can imagine 
but it's just so much quicker to whip up like an Instagram post, for example, or a TikTok. So I guess what I'm trying to say is if you want more sort of just random gym tidbits here and there, definitely suss the Twitter, the Instagram or the TikToks for either accounts that will sort of be specific to one realm or the other, especially gamification of life. It's just, it's just a lot easier for me to whip up some stock info and chuck it on there as opposed to making a video every time I find out some stock tidbits. And then the same with the gamification. I've got like a massive backlog of podcasts I used to listen to and take notes on that I'll slowly like release as I get time throughout the day that'll be just be chucked on there maybe it can help you out so that's why that's there as well it's not going to go on the it's not going to go on the gamification insta or twitter because as I just mentioned there's like a sort of niche audience I have on the other platforms a lot of my audience on this youtube channel cares about both which is fantastic. However, that's just not how a lot of other people roll, which is a shame because they're both rather important. Like, you know, your health and money, like there's not really many things that are more important than that other than, you know, your family and social life and blah, 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 and all that stuff. But I hope you get the point. So that's why they're both plugged there. And yeah, it's a bit of a twin headed dragon approach so yeah, although gamification of life has gym related videos, the quicker, easier gym related posts are on gamification as, as you would, would be able to tell if you suss the Instagram or TikTok. And if you want random gym tidbits more frequently, check out the gamification, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. So they're the three ones that I'm mainly active on. I've, I've made a LinkedIn page and a Facebook page just so I can sort of I guess have them there although there's not really a lot that goes on there and most like the pretty much no no gym rat has LinkedIn anyway it's more of like a career thing so so yeah basically the gist of it is if you want I guess more frequent tidbits follow them I will still upload YouTube videos and most of the like juicy stuff will go to YouTube but I guess if you just want more frequent info and just some random tidbits sprinkled in here and there. Check out those. So I hope you don't find the little plug annoying, but it's not like I'm plugging some shitty sponsor or anything like that. Again, I don't really mind if you don't end up following those. It's just a for your information thing that nothing's gonna change with this YouTube channel. I'll still give you guys the golden tidbits. Anyway, let's get on with it. So here we go with vitamins and minerals so vitamins we've got vitamin a vitamin b1 which is thiamine vitamin b2 which is riboflavin vitamin b3 which is niacin vitamin b5 which is pantothenic acid vitamin b6 which is pyridoxine vitamin b7 which is biotin vitamin b9 which is folate vitamin b12 which is cobalamin vitamin c vitamin d vitamin E and vitamin K. So the vitamins in orange are fat soluble. The vitamins in blue are water soluble, but we'll briefly touch on that in a moment. So the minerals, we've got calcium, choline, chloride, chromium, copper, iodine, iron, magnesium, manganese, molybdenum, phosphorus, potassium, selenium, sodium, and zinc. So fat soluble, water soluble, and fructose. This is just a little quick slide for some informational tidbits. Fun fact, your liver can only store around 75 to 100 grams of fructose as glycogen per day, like roughly that amount, at least from what I've seen. So as long as you don't go overboard with fruit consumption, you won't have any fructose being stored as fat. Although obviously sticking to a calorie deficit is the number one priority with this sort of stuff. And this diet includes about 70-ish, 79 grams of fructose. It kind of depends on the serving size of like kiwi, for example. Like not all kiwis are the same size, but you know, we are under this 100 gram amount and we're like hovering around 70. So in this diet, we'll be right. 
So fat soluble means that the vitamin or mineral, or mainly the vitamin, is dissolved in fat. And thus eating fat with a meal containing fat soluble vitamins is ideal, which we have done in this diet that I'll show you. Now water soluble, this means the vitamin or mineral is dissolved in water and thus it's ideal to drink water with every meal as most meals will contain some sort of water soluble vitamin or mineral anyway. So another thing is a lot of foods naturally contain the vitamins and fat or slash water required to increase nutrient absorption. So for example, eggs are high in vitamin K amongst a lot of other things that you'll see and vitamin K is fat soluble. Eggs are high in fat, at least the yolk is. So therefore a fat soluble vitamin, vitamin K, that you find in a natural food such as eggs is fat soluble and it's high in fat. So that works out fine. Another example is wheat germ oil, which is high in vitamin E. Vitamin E is a fat soluble vitamin and wheat germ oil is high in fat. So therefore, you get better absorption of the vitamin E you get from wheat germ oil. Kiwis and oranges are high in vitamin C. Vitamin C is a water soluble vitamin and kiwis and oranges have a lot of water in them. So you're starting to see the pattern here. And if you're having trouble remembering which vitamins are fat soluble and water soluble, just think of Drake, D-R-A-K-E. There's no vitamin R, but the other vitamins are all fat soluble. Drake, the fat singer for fat soluble vitamins. <laughs> I'm just joking, but uh, not really. Nah, but I'm joking, but that's a good way to remember it. So these are non-essential, but I included them anyway. So there's betaine, which is produced from consuming choline. We'll go into it later. Fluoride, now this is needed for teeth and it's not essential for human growth, which is why it's not technically essential. And it's in toothpaste anyway, but this diet tends to have some fluoride anyway. Um, but we'll get into that when we get to that. And sulfur as well. Now this is something that's used in food production. So most foods will naturally contain this, but I've added in some rough sulfur sort of I guess intakes anyway but you know we'll get there when we get there hey so now we're going to go over why all of these nutrients are important in regards to gym strictly gym so if it was in terms of general health we'd be here for hours like i'd just be reading off some medical articles saying oh calcium has been shown to reduce cancer and potassium has been shown to increase heart health or just some shit like that we're going to strictly talk about it from a gym sense now i'm only speaking from my expertise as a personal trainer and not a medical doctor so you know obviously this is not medical advice if you've got some sort of nutrition issues go speak to a professional and once we're done with that we're going to go through a diet that contains all of the recommended allotment of these as well as meal combinations that combine these nutrients and enhances their absorption. So there are some nutrients that work well with others. For example, vitamin C and iron, they work well together. All right, now I said I wasn't gonna talk much about protein or fats or carbs in this video, but there's something I need to touch on real quick. So there are different types of fats. So transaturated fats never consume these. So these are usually found in like fast food stuff. So from memory, they take like 37 days to clear your system. Uh, I haven't really read up on them much. I haven't read up on them in years, but basically they're pretty much toxic. So try to limit your consumption of these. Saturated fats, there is sort of a gray area. The research is a little bit mixed. Um, unsaturated fats, they're good. Monounsaturated fats, they're good. And polyunsaturated fats, they're good as well, at least from what I've seen. Now that little text at the bottom, you'll note that I haven't split fats up into saturated and unsaturated fats along with polyunsaturated and monounsaturated. For the purposes of your diet, you won't need to be concerned with this as you'll have more than as you'll have more important things to worry about. Now this is an extract from a nutrition plan that I did for one of my powerlifter friends back in 2020, which is what sort of prompted me to make this video. I figured I'd do a bit of an update on it. Um, check any updates in the research, recheck all the facts and whatnot. 
and then give it to you guys. And the reason we were concerned with all this was because generally, like if you're healthier, you can perform better at, in the gym anyway. So that's another reason that this diet is probably one of the better ones that you'll see because it actually takes into consideration every essential vitamin and mineral. Like I've felt so much better once I've sort of consumed all of these, whereas I wasn't in the past. So another thing, canola oils, sunflower and corn oils. These aren't good sources of fat, as you can see on that image. I have see I put those arrows next to this sort of article I found, and they had mentioned that these were a source of fat. Uh, nah, they're not like they are, but don't, don't have these. Um, those two videos you've seen screenshotted sort of below that text, there's some good information on nutrition in those videos in general, so definitely check them out. But they also mentioned this, so if you want sort of more, I guess, evidence to support this, you could obviously go and Google it yourself, but give these videos a listen and listen to what the experts say. Now in this other article I was reading, they literally said good plant sources, and then they said canola or soybean oil, which they're not. So don't take everything you see as gospel, you gotta delve into the information a little bit more and do your own research and come to your own conclusion. And that applies with everything you see in this video as well. Like I've gone through a lot of stuff, but there could be something I've missed. Like I don't think there is, but if there is something I've missed, let me know and that way I can learn, you can learn, we can all learn. So here's just another thing to further support the no processed oils argument. So some cooking oils are fine, however, so oils produced using hexane is a big no. So oils that are good are coconut oil, extra virgin olive oil, and avocado oil. Now I personally just use butter. Yeah, they're higher in calories, but there's none of the toxic sort of stuff. If you're deep into a cut and you don't have many calories to play around with, then it becomes a trade-off. Like, do you want less calories in exchange for essentially mild poison? Or do you want to cut calories elsewhere in your diet but have less toxins in your body overall? This will be something that you have to decide yourself. Alright, so I didn't mention almond oil before, but apparently sometimes it can be extracted using hexane, which means you shouldn't consume it. But there are some products that are hexane free, as you can see in those little images there. So you could probably just suss hexane free oils for your cooking needs. And by the way, the reason corporations use these anyway, despite the fact that they're pretty much mild poison, is because it's so cheap to produce. It costs barely anything. Well, it did until the sanctions against Russia caused a supply shock, uh, as well as the massive monetary stimulus from all the central banks around the world, or at least most of them. But that's a topic outside of this video. The point is, it's pretty much cheap for companies to use these oils. So again, price increases are mainly due to inflation, which is primarily due to the excess money supply. Again, a topic outside the scope of this video, but the basic economics of supply and demand dictate a supply shortage with no change in demand, which equals higher prices, coupled with the massive amount of money chasing, a few, chasing fewer goods the increase in money supply without an increase, without a corresponding increase in production will lead to higher prices across the board. So yeah, it's a little bit weird having my finance and my fitness brain intertwined in one video, which is why you got both of my babies pinned down there at the bottom of each of these slides. All right, so why did I mention all this? Am I just flexing some knowledge? Well, because this diet contains butter, so you might be thinking, well, why don't we just use cooking oils like vegetable oils? Well, this is the reason why I have butter. So omega-3s, we stay under 3,000 milligrams or 3 grams of omega-3s here, so don't worry about that. And 3,000 is sort of like the general sort of upper limit. At least that 3,000 upper limit is basically what's generally accepted across the board. Omega-3s are required in your diet since your body doesn't actually produce these. Now these Omega-3s are primarily for health reasons that indirectly translate to gym, but 
we hit our omega-3 recommended intake regardless. Some of the foods naturally contain it and then we just have two fish oil supplements to help bump us up. So as for omega-6s, we don't actually hit the RDA as it would require too many calories. So like we'll go into it later, but basically out of all the foods we consume, if we were trying to hit our omega-6 RDA, we'd just have such high calories and then it wouldn't be a like a diet to recommend across the board like a base diet because it'd just be too many calories in it too many people would gain too much weight on it so you can just use supplements to hit the rest of your omega-6 intake now the reason there's no actual supplements in the excel doc that i've got as you'll see is because i didn't actually realize i wasn't hitting my omega-6s until i was going back through this so obviously if you want to actually hit everything, just sort of copy the diet and then add in some omega-6 supplements. So omega-6s are essential to ingest as well since your body doesn't produce these, much the same as omega-3s. Now omega-6s are good for, well they say maintain bone health so you don't end up like Paul George or Sean Livingston or Gordon Hayward. Any of you who don't follow the NBA, basically these guys literally snapped their bones while playing basketball so yeah we uh, don't want that and then yeah bone health is just good in general hey and it also helps regulate metabolism obviously this is good for your aesthetics you don't want to have to diet on too low a calories hey you want to have a decent metabolic rate now omega-9s are not essential since they're produced by your body so we don't really talk much about it here all right so now we're jumping into the vitamins so we'll start off alphabetically hey Vitamin A. Now, the recommended intake of this is 3,000 IUs a day, but we go well above this. And vitamin A is not dangerous if you go too far above this, but we'll get into that. So, short story, healthy vision, skin, bones, and teeth, and reproduction. But we'll delve into it a bit more. Not a short story, there's two main types of vitamin A. There's Preformed vitamin A, an active kind your body uses more readily and is only found in animal products like beef, liver, chicken liver, for example. Basically, animal livers are really good sources for this. And then there's provitamin A. Now, this is a kind your body has to convert into its active form. Most commonly, beta carotene, and most people know carrots are good for eyesight. Hence, it's usually a good go-to source of vitamin A. However, most people don't know that vitamin A carrots are in carotene form and not the retinal form, meaning your body takes longer to process it. So animal liver is a more efficient method of vitamin A. So that's more so just for your information. We don't actually have liver in this diet because liver tastes like shit and most people won't eat it. And sometimes it can be kind of hard to find, but we have like so much vitamin A from sweet potato anyway, that we don't really need to worry about this whole conversion thing. And just a little side note, uh, the reason carrots and sweet potato are orange is because of the, it's because of the type of vitamin A that they are, that they contain. Now, vitamin A also plays a vital role in maintaining your body's natural defenses, such as mucus barriers in your eyes, lungs, guts, and genitals, which help track bacteria and other infectious agents. So why do I bring this up? Well, the less sick you get, the less you need to take time away from the gym and the more resources your body has to recover from the gym as opposed to a sickness. So those of you who have been sick before, which is everyone, did you go to the gym? Like you may have, but if you're really sick, then you have to spend time off gym recovering, right? And if you went to the gym, in some cases, you'll find that that just made your sickness even worse and it took you even longer to recover. Sometimes you just need a break. You need time off gym to give your body a break and to recover. So that's where this plays in. If you're, can, if you're having enough vitamin A, then you don't need to take as much of a break from gym because your body has its defenses well underway. It doesn't need to take a time out to get them back up and running. So vitamin A also reduces the risk of acne. Now, there isn't conclusive evidence as to why, but a vitamin A deficiency has been shown to cause over, overproduction of the protein carotene in your hair follicles, 
which makes it more difficult for dead skin cells to be removed from hair follicles, leading to blockages. So I mentioned this because my mate was having acne issues and I was too, so that's just something to keep in mind. I guess if you're having trouble with skin, because I know vitamin A does help skin, but in terms of acne, maybe this is a good, good launching point for you to sort of look into it like, hey, maybe I can have a look at vitamin A products that can help me with acne. Now, eh, vitamin A may support bone health. The key nutrients for bone health are protein, calcium, and vitamin D, as well as vitamin K too, but we'll get into that later. There has been links in studies to vitamin A and increased bone health, but further studies are required. So yeah, at the time of writing that in 2020, there wasn't many studies and I still couldn't find any. So it also promotes healthy growth and reproduction as vitamin A is essential in maintaining a healthy reproductive system in both men and women. So yeah, told my mate to get balls deep. And vitamin A is fat soluble. Remember, Drake, fat, D-R-A-K-E, vitamin A is fat soluble. Thus, it's dissolved and absorbed and stored by fat tissue. Hence, if you're looking to increase vitamin A levels, you'll significantly improve your body's absorption if you eat it with a fatty source, aka like, I guess, beef liver and animal livers. But regardless, most of our vitamin A in this diet comes from sweet potato, and we have sweet potato with beef. Now, beef is high in fat, so therefore we increase vitamin A absorption. And the recommended intake is 3,000 IUs, but we go well above this, but you know, we'll get to that when we get to that. So vitamin C, short story, vitamin C is involved in protein metabolism and it's needed for collagen, which is a connective tissue, obviously good for your tendons and whatnot in your body. And it is an antioxidant and has also been shown to regenerate other antioxidants. So, so there's been a few, I guess, professionals that sort of specialize in vitamin C and although the recommended intake is 90 micrograms they're saying 500 should be the RDA now we don't actually hit this in this diet just because that would involve like a lot of like kiwis and oranges for example but if this is something that you are concerned with definitely look into it and maybe increase your intake you could supplement it, but I'm not really a fan of supplements. I prefer to just get things through food or natural sources if you can. Uh, and then 2000 micrograms has been shown to be pretty bad, but you have to really be trying to get that amount. So we'll be right. Now, not a short story. It's unlikely too much vitamin C can be harmful, but mega dosing vitamin C supplements may cause diarrhea and nausea. The upper limit is 2000 micrograms a day. So you know, just mentioned that. 75 to 90 micrograms a day is the RDA, but there's a doctor I was talking about. Mark Moyad, hope I pronounced that right. Uh, medical doctor, MPH, whatever that means, of the University of Michigan. So basically this guy studies vitamin C a lot. I also just mentioned that. Suggests that an intake of 500 micrograms is more ideal. He also states that there is a great track record with strong evidence that taking 500 milligrams a day is safe. So going over the RDA ain't going to hurt nobody. Sorry, I've been saying micrograms, I meant milligrams. Now, vitamin C helps the body absorb the iron from plants, which is non-heme iron, and stores it into a form that's more bioavailable, which is why I was saying before vitamin C works well with iron. Now, a study showed that 100 milligrams of vitamin C with a meal increased the absorption by 67%. So, basically, the point of bringing that up is have iron with vitamin C. So, for example, we have kiwi in this diet, and we have it with beef and sweet potato. Now, beef is high in iron. So, although the study was on, like, non-heme iron, we like it, it'll still help iron regardless um you could have i guess <laughs> you could have the kiwi with like a grain or something like another plant source that has iron in it but it's just better if you just have kiwis with the beef anyway 
So obviously vitamin C from the kiwi and iron from the beef, again, another juicy combination. Now vitamin D. Now, vitamin D has several important functions and perhaps the most vital are regulating the absorption of calcium and phosphorus and facilitating normal immune system function. Now getting a sufficient amount of vitamin D is important for normal growth and the development of bones and teeth, as well as improved resistance against certain diseases. Now this general health, like I'll just, yeah, I said strictly gym earlier, but obviously if you're just generally healthy, you'll perform better in the gym, hey. Now vitamin D is produced in your skin in response to sunlight. You can also get it from diet, Ideally do both. The problem is there's not a lot of foods that have a lot of vitamin D. So this is one thing I actually will supplement if I can't get it from the sun. And at the moment it's winter here in Australia. I don't know when the last time I actually properly saw the sun is. So yeah, I've been supplementing vitamin D for a couple of months now. Now there is a study that shows vitamin D assisting in weight loss. Obviously we all know that's more of a calorie equation, but I'll mention this anyway. The scientists said the extra calcium and vitamin D had an appetite suppressing effect. Now this is nifty because you'll be less tempted to snack on junk foods. Now it's also been linked to reducing depression, uh, which, which is obviously very helpful, but there's other factors that play into that, but that's just something I thought I'd mention. Now you can also use a multivitamin to get some vitamin D if you wish, just to be safe. Now I use some from myvitamins.com, now it's from the UK. We have some here in Australia, I guess I could suss them as well. They're pretty cheap, so don't sting out on getting your vitamin D because it's not that expensive and it's pretty essential for your health and chances are if you're living basically somewhere that's not in the, near the middle of the equator like Spain or Miami or like the Philippines or Thailand or Bali then you're probably not getting enough vitamin D hey so here is some information I got from Stan Efforting now this is important to know now vitamin D is actually a hormone that's actually like it's a hormone that's actually a secosteroid that's sort of wrongly been labeled as a vitamin but you know we'll roll with it hey not much we can do about it now ideally you eat your food first and foremost with you know in regards to all nutrients but the problem with vitamin d is it isn't in is it isn't in as many foods which is what i mentioned before clean eaters don't eat any processed foods that have been fortified with vitamin d like some cereals and milk will have vitamin d sort of fortified into the product so they artificially put vitamin d into it because like the health the health government people whoever they are know that people will eat they won't really give a crap about their vitamin d intakes but they will eat milk and cereal so it's like okay well we'll put vitamin d in them so that way they'll they won't be as unhealthy now it can be found in many fatty fish like salmon sardines and cod liver oil but it's unlikely you're getting enough of this to get your requirements in which is why you know get some sun another thing i'll quickly mention is sunscreen actually sort of blocks the vitamin d that your skin absorbs so you got to find the healthy balance between not getting sunburnt or skin cancer and actually getting vitamin d but that's outside the scope of this video that's something that unfortunately you'll have to go and check out yourself now vitamin d is synthesized by the skin when exposed to the sun I mentioned that before Vitamin D helps improve absorption of many important minerals such as calcium, iron, magnesium, and zinc. I didn't mention that before, but you know, basically vitamin D helps everything. Vitamin D also helps immune system. It also helps sleep and performance, helps your energy levels. You don't wake up as tired and recovering from workouts is a bit easier. And what Stan Efferding found was that his bones and muscles stopped aching as much when he was increasing his vitamin D intake. I don't have this problem because I'm nowhere near as big and ripped as he is, but this might be something that you'll look into if your muscles and bones are aching, try upping that vitamin D intake. Now if you're going to get a blood test to check out where your vitamin D levels are, go for the vitamin D 25 hydroxy test, it measures the amount of vitamin D in the bloodstream, 
The normal range is around 30 to 100, and vitamin D deficiencies can take weeks or months to rectify. Since it's uh, fat soluble, it's, it's a little bit slower moving. Now, hemoglobin A1C is a marker for type 2 diabetes. Supplementing with vitamin D helps this. Pre-diabetic range is 5.7. The type 2 diabetes drug metformin didn't help Stan reducing this. And dropping weight didn't help either because he took human growth hormone, which is known to cause insulin resistance. And there's been a it's shown that there's an inverse relationship between type 2 diabetes and vitamin D. So, why did I bring all that up? It's just some nice information to know. And basically, vitamin D is basically, couldn't, in case you couldn't tell, vitamin D is very important. So, yeah, if you think you're not getting enough or you just want to know, go and get a blood test. And that blood test I mentioned there, that was just what he said in where he lives in America. Uh, when I went to get my blood test here in Australia, I didn't ask for a vitamin D 25 hydroxy I think they just you just ask your doc. Can I get vitamin D 3 levels tested? So again, you'll have to check with your local area But yeah, definitely get a blood test check where your vitamin D is at vitamin E So in addition to its activities as an antioxidant vitamin E is involved in immune function and Just a bunch of other stuff that you can see there, but basically immune function metabolic processes just general health stuff now the RDA of vitamin E is around 15 milligrams. Now this is easy to hit with wheat germ oil. You just literally take a shot of it and boom, done. Now I briefly mentioned this in a couple other videos, but basically vitamin E is kind of hard to get unless you're actively trying to get it. Like it's found in like some leafy greens and nuts and stuff, but it's unlikely you're having enough of these to get your vitamin E intake. So um, wheat germ oil, you kind of have to order this online at least I've never actually seen weed germ oil just on the supermarket shelves so you have to sort of order this online you know it comes in a little packet and yeah you literally just take shots of it I don't mind the taste I can imagine some people find it a bit weird but you know suck it up like what what did you expect vitamin E and all these healthy nutrients to taste like chocolate or something you know if this if all this healthy stuff was easy and tasty then everyone would be doing it now, vitamin E also has other health benefits like protective properties against coronary heart disease, cancer, eye diabetes, and cognitive decline. So we don't want any of that. We don't want any of that, do we? The upper limit is 1,000 milligrams, which is pretty fucking hard to get without actively trying for it. Like that's like you'd have to just be like beer funneling wheat germ oil instead of beer or something. Now, most of these issues cause from megadosing vitamins. So again, with the whole supplementing vitamins thing, just get it from your food. You probably won't really overdose on any vitamins or minerals if you're getting it all from food. Now, if you do megadose, some issues shown in the studies include hemorrhage and interruption of blood coagulation in animals, at least. Now, it's important to note a lot of animal studies carry over to human replication too. So just because they're done in like animals doesn't mean they're not gonna it's not gonna be the same in humans and in fact most cancer studies are done in rats so just because they're done in animals doesn't mean they're no they hold no merit so a little bit more info on vitamin e vitamin e is used for cell communication to strengthen the immune system and to form red blood cells much the same way vitamin d helps the body use calcium vitamin e helps the body use vitamin k now in the past it was believed that taking vitamin E supplements also might prevent a variety of diseases including heart disease, cancers, Alzheimer's. However, current research provides little evidence that taking vitamin E supplements prevents these diseases and the risks and benefits of taking vitamin E supplements are still unclear in regards to this health thing. So just mention it just in case you hear it somewhere. It might be some, you know, again, a good springboard for you to go and do your own research on it. Now, vitamin E is found naturally in some foods, and it's added to some foods to fortify it with vitamin E. As I mentioned before, it's kind of one of those nutrients that doesn't really get... Most people's intake of it is quite low, so that's why some foods are fortified with it. So vitamin E is found in foods such as vegetable oils, which I mentioned before, don't have that. Nuts and seeds, but you're probably not having enough of them to get vitamin enough vitamin E. 
green vegetables, same boat as nuts, you're probably not having enough. And some enriched cereals, but you're probably just better off having that shot of wheat gym oil, as I mentioned before. All right, now, B vitamins. Vitamin B1, thiamine. Thiamine can only be stored in the body for a short time before it's excreted, because, you know, water-soluble. You know, you urinate pretty frequently. You don't really excrete fat <laughs> that frequently, now, do you? Like, that, that's not how it works, by the way, but, you know, basically, water-soluble vitamins tend to leave your system a bit quicker. Which is why you tend to need these more frequently. Um, while we're on it, vitamin E, what I just mentioned, fat soluble. I don't take a shot of wheat germ oil every day, although I should, but I take it like twice a week. It's fat soluble, so it's not going to leave my system that quickly. So back to thiamine. Thiamine can only be stored in the body for a short period of time before excretion. A regular dietary intake of thiamine is necessary to maintain proper blood levels. The RDI for adults over the age of 18 is about 1.2 milligrams per day for men, so so Lemaire already hit this. The RDI for adults over the age of 18 is 1.2 milligrams a day and it's 1.1 milligrams for women. Wow, such a big difference. Individuals with excessive carbohydrate consumption may fail to compensate by increasing their level of thiamine intake resulting in a thiamine deficiency since thiamine plays a role in carbohydrate metabolism now i the carb intake in this diet isn't excessively high so we're fine but if you're one of the really big boys eating a lot of carbs you might want to check your uh, vitamin b1 intake now decreased thiamine levels can result in reduced enzymatic activity altered mitochondrial activity impaired oxidative metabolism and reduced energy production. And we don't want reduced energy production, do we? Because we want to go to the gym and hit them PBs. Now, the other B1 and B2 bananas, we've got vitamin B2 riboflavin. Now, riboflavin helps break down proteins, fats, and carbs, so your macronutrients. It plays a vital role in maintaining the body's energy supply, too. Riboflavin helps convert carbohydrates into ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is like an sort of energy thing related to carbs. So sufficient B2 will assist in gym performance. The RDA of vitamin B2 for males between 90 and 50 years is 1.3 milligrams, which we get just fine. Vitamin B2 is water soluble, as we know. So cooking it can cause some B2 to be lost. So about twice as much B2 is lost through boiling as opposed to steaming or microwaving. Now, with this caveat, I wouldn't recommend eating things like cold wheat bix, for example. Just microwave your bowl. Although it may cause some B2 to be lost, we intake more B2 with beef. And although beef obviously will need to be cooked and microwaved, combining these two sources of wheat bix and beef will easily help us cover these B2 requirements, despite the degradation in some of the nutritional value. So what I just mentioned there, because this is an extract taken from the comments I left on my nutrition plan for my powerlifter friend. I had wheat bix for him. In this diet, we have wheat bites, which we just sort of snack on. Like for me personally, I just snack on it at my desk in my office job. Obviously, you could just chuck in some milk with this. Again, the diet is just a base. This is just like a base for you to work off. Copy it if you want, but you know, make your own adjustments as necessary but that's just something i thought i'd mention it's probably not a huge deal but it's important to know that i guess if you're going to be super strict on this if you like heat up vitamin heat up foods that contain vitamin b2 some of the nutritional value can be lost but this is probably something that you don't really need to worry about it's just something i thought i'd mention just in the off chance that there are any like high level bodybuilders watching this so no more B1 and B2 bananas in pajamas, sad reacts in the chat. So now we're on to vitamin B3, niacin. Niacin plays a role in cellular signaling, which is a communication process that governs basic activities of cells and coordinates multiple cell actions. And thus it can help your body coordinate compound movements better, like, you know, when your body can actually talk to each other. So it also helps metabolism, which is a no, it's no brainer why this is important and DNA production and repair, again, you know, just repairing from gym, just generally healthy shit. 
So the RDA for vitamin B3 is 16 milligrams, which we hit. Don't need to worry about that. We're all good. Now, vitamin B5, pantothenic acid, the RDA for this is 5 milligrams. Vitamin B5, pantothenic acid, this helps your body obtain energy from food and is also involved in hormone and cholesterol production. Thus, the food you eat will be better directed to fuel for gym sessions. And the RDA, and the RDA of this is 5 milligrams, and we hit this, we're fine. Vitamin B6, pyridoxine so pyridoxine is involved in amino acid metabolism so that's just generally good for you know protein and muscles in general hey red blood cell production and what this means is they help they transport oxygen to the body's tissues in exchange for carbon dioxide and this helps your body recover and repair itself as we know that helps with gym and the creation of neurotransmitters which helps nerve impulses which is helpful for muscle contractions which is helpful for smashing out those PRs at the gym. Now the RDA of B6 for males our age, my mate and I have similar ages, is 1.3 milligrams. Now we hit this number almost purely just for protein from protein powder and beef but there are a few other foods that contain little bits of this but we we hit it regardless. We also have some tuna which contains some vitamin B6 but the point is we hit this no problem. Now actually one thing I'll mention is I mentioned protein powder just then. I had a we had a specific protein powder that I looked at that my friend always used and I I could read the you know the vitamin and mineral intakes from that but for the purposes of this diet, I've only kept just the protein amount from a, pro a scoop of protein powder. I didn't include any vitamins or minerals because that will kind of, it'll kind of depend on the protein powder you're using. But regardless, we hit all the intakes anyway. And it's not like you're going to, you know, overdose on any of the nutrients from a scoop of protein powder. So I thought I'd just mention that now. But that's something I'll touch on again later. Uh, and by the way, if you're not a male around the age of like 20-ish, the RDA doesn't really change a whole lot anyway, so, you know, if you're a female who's a bit older or a bit younger, 1.3 milligrams is still probably a good range. But if you're really concerned, go and check out the recommended intakes for your age and gender yourself, and then obviously adjust the diet as needed. Vitamin B7, biotin. Now, this is essential for carbohydrate and fat metabolism and regulates gene expression. So, you know, carbohydrate and fat metabolism, it's nutrient partitioning for gym. Vitamin B7 promotes appropriate function of the nervous system and is essential for liver metabolism as well. Generally good healthy stuff, nutrient partitioning, general gym performance. Biotin is commonly advised as a dietary supplement for strengthening hair and nails, as well as in skincare and it is suggested that biotin aids in cell growth and the maintenance and the maintenance of mucous membranes. So that's just some other general health stuff. And the RDA is 30 micrograms, and we hit this no problem. Vitamin B9, folate. So folate's needed for cell growth, amino acid metabolism, the formation of red and white blood cells, and proper cell division. And cell division helps the body repair itself. So ideal for them taxing gym sessions. The RDA is 400 micrograms. We get this, no problem. Vitamin B12, cobalamin. This one's a pretty important one. Vitamin B12 is vital. What a strong word. For neurological function, DNA production, and red blood cell development. Now, as you know by now, these are important, not only for health, but they'll have flow and effects to your gym performance, better gym performance, more muscle kept during cutting and even more calories burnt during the workout and obviously more muscle as you're bulking too. Now B12 is primarily found in animal products. Some fruits and vegetables have them but they have such a low amount you're better off, you're better off getting it from animal products so this is one flaw of the vegan diet. It tends to be low in a lot of nutrients but B12 is one of the main ones. So yeah that's why we have meat. Uh, now, the recommended intake is 2.4 micrograms. We get this no problem. Don't worry, I, I've got it covered. Now, vitamin K. Vitamin K is a group name for a number of compounds that help the body make proteins necessary for blood clotting. 
Now because of this role, vitamin K is used to reverse the anticoagulant effects of blood thinners when too much is given. For this reason, people taking blood thinners may need to be careful about how much vitamin K they take in. Now that's something that is important for you to take note of if you ever are taking blood thinners. Vitamin K is also given to newborns who do not have enough of it naturally occurring to prevent clotting problems. Now, vitamin K1 can be found in leafy greens, cruciferous vegetables. Cruciferous vegetables are like vegetables that sort of like fluff up, I guess, like cauliflower, for example, oh, such as broccoli or cabbage. Yeah, broccoli and cabbage too. Vitamin K2 is found in fish, liver, meats, and eggs. So vitamin K2 from animals, vitamin K1 from the plants and shit. Now spinach is high in vitamin K but it's vitamin K1 not K2 which I just mentioned was found in animal products. Now I mentioned in another video before the recession is imminent video I briefly touched on how eggs from pet chickens are better than free-range eggs and free-range eggs are better than caged eggs and the images you're seeing are just some and that's because generally the healthier the chicken, the better the nutrients in the eggs are. So here's just some more info. Too long, didn't read. We need vitamin two. We need vitamin K2 in the diet. And the RDA is 120 micrograms, which we get. Now vitamin K is also required to funnel calcium into the bones. Now without this, calcium can be deposited in arteries and soft tissue, which is not ideal. And so what you're seeing on that screen is just some side effects. If you have too much vitamin K, but because we're not mega dosing supplements, we're fine. So again, that's just something to keep in mind. All right, so now we move on to the minerals. Now, iron, iron is the only mineral in the body that has no mechanism for excretion. It is entirely regulated by absorption and therefore monitoring iron intake is important. Since it can form free radicals, which are atoms or molecules that are highly reactive with other cellular structures because they contain unpaired electrons. And this is bad because damage to DNA by free radicals can result in mutations and promote cancer, which means you die earlier, which means you spend less time being shredded, which is not good. Also, they can oxidize low density lip lipoproteins which is bad cholesterol, making it more likely to get trapped in the artery walls, clogging blood vessels and leading to cardiovascular disease. Now iron is used as a building block for hemoglobin, which is a protein found in red blood cells that helps shuttle oxygen around your body. Obviously a good thing. It is also a component of myoglobin, which is an oxygen storage protein found in your muscles. This oxygen is used when you use your muscles. so. It'll help a lot with gym performance, as I keep mentioning. It is also involved in other metabolic processes, including oxygen transport, DNA synthesis, and electron transport. So yeah, RDA is 16 to 18 milligrams, which we get. Now the upper limit is around 45 milligrams a day, but from what I've seen, it's primarily due to GI distress, which is what causes this 45 milligram cap. Now, another thing I'll mention, this little note here, it's, it's a little note I left from my mate, but it says, you may note that beef is only around 5.25 milligrams for a 150 gram serving and be like, yo, WTF, it's less than wheat bix Well, this is cause the iron in beef is heme iron, which is more easily digested in your body. Whereas iron from plant-based sources is called non-heme iron. And this is around 30 to 60% less, vi less bioavailable than animal products. The RDA takes into account this fact and your miscellaneous chicken meals and tuna, you'll hit your RDA without any worries. So, so basically don't worry, we hit our RDA regardless. We do have some iron from like grains, but, but we hit enough from our animal products. Now, betaine. Now, betaine is not technically essential. So, if choline is considered not essential, which is something we'll get into, then neither is neither is betaine because betaine is like can be produced from choline. 
And but what this does though is it helps me metabolize a specific amino acid, which is like related to protein for muscle growth. The intake's recovered in the diet anyway. Like we don't actively include foods that contain this to hit the intake. It just happens that this intake is hit with the other foods that we that we consume, and the RDA is 15 milligrams. Chromium. Now, this is an essential trace mineral that can improve insulin sensitivity and enhance protein, carbohydrate, and lipid metabolism, which is the absolute king. So chromium is an absolute king for nutrient partitioning. It is a metallic element that people need in very small quantities. There is limited information about the exact amount of chromium required and what it does. As studies so far have produced conflicting results, experts state the adequate intake of chromium for males is 25 to 35 micrograms. Now there are a range of foods that contain chromium and to be honest a fair of them aren't included in this guideline but one source of chromium is whole grains which we do have but also eggs which we have so you know we hit this regardless. Now the amount of chromium in whole grains is unknown but if you're really concerned with your intake of hitting chromium then a cup of broccoli contains around 22 micrograms, which is close to what's needed. So if you're really concerned with your chromium intake, have a cup of broccoli. Now, I didn't include broccoli in this particular diet just because of its relevance in terms of FODMAP, but if you have a little bit of broccoli, you should be fine. But for me personally, I don't have it in my diet. I used to back in the day, but now I just don't really have a need for it. And it's pretty low in calories, so it's not like it's going to blow out your caloric budget or anything. Now, fluoride. Now, fluoride helps prevent tooth decay by making the tooth more resistant to acid attacks from plaque, bacteria, and sugars in the mouth. And it also reverses early decay. Now, I couldn't find anything useful that tells me if your consumption of fluoride from food is important, or if you can overdo it. But it seems that fluoride in your toothpaste is the most important part. So my dentist had actually asked me in one of my last appointments, she's like, do you brush with toothpaste? I was like, yeah. She's like, do you, does a toothpaste have fluoride in it? I was like, I, I think. She's like, what brand is it? I was like, Colgate. Recommended by nine out of 10 dentists. And she was like, oh yeah, that's fine. Colgate has uh, fluoride in it. And I was like, do some people brush with no fluoride? She's like, some people brush with no toothpaste. I was like, that's disgusting. But anyway, here's just some more fluoride info to show you that I actually, you know, I actually had a thorough look and I couldn't find anything useful. All the info just pertained to like the healthier teeth and shit, nothing to do with the actual diet. Um, and then this slide, after more digging, turns out it's not an essential nutrient, which I mentioned in the intro. But friendly tip, make sure you have fluoride in your toothpaste. Most of them do, so, you know, got to look out for your teeth, because you want them facial aesthetics too. Iodine, or oh, this is one of my favorites. Iodine is another misunderstood nutrient, which has important health benefits. Now, approximately 2 billion people worldwide suffer from iodine deficiency, which allegedly causes mental retardation, and it also causes goiter and thyroid disease. Now, iodine was added to table salt to reduce the instance of goiter, which is an enlarged thyroid gland. And thyroid disease results in a slowed metabolism, which results in weight gain. And it also causes fatigue and other symptoms of hypothyroidism. So, uh, quote, before you start popping T3 like candy, consider you may benefit from the use of iodized salt. So that's another thing I grabbed from Stan Efferding. Um, popping T3 like candy. Someone will understand exactly what that means. I know it's relevant, but it doesn't, it's not really relevant to me. So I guess just check your iodine intake, hey. The RDA, the RDA is within a somewhat broad range, but 300 micrograms is on the upper range and 1,110 micrograms from what I've seen is not recommended, but we don't go near this amount anyway, so we Gucci. So calcium, the old calcium, everyone knows about that, you get it from your milk. Now, required for bones, no shit, everyone knows that. 
uh, but it's required from bo for bones in tandem with vitamin D3 and K2. And calcium, when used with magnesium and zinc, it can help you sleep. Um, I guess try this if you're having trouble sleeping, but for me personally, just use CBD products. Just find some online anywhere. Now, when used with iodine, salt, and fruit, it can stimulate met your metabolism a little bit. This is just a general tidbit. I don't actually combine these in any sort of in any sort of meal specifically. I do have iodized table salt with my beef, which is coupled with my kiwi, but I don't really have any calcium with it. Like there's a little bit of calcium in sweet potato and kiwi, but it's really not much. But this is just something for you. Again, this is just a bit of a tidbit for you to further delve into if you find that helpful. So calcium, when used with magnesium and potassium, it can help relax your blood vessels, which, like if you're having high blood pressure, is obviously a good idea. And there's other general health benefits like cancer prevention and heart health and stuff like that, but, you know, most of these have those sort of effects. Now, this is something interesting I found. Quote, too much thyroid... This gets stimulated via iodine, which is a reason for the cap on the iodine intake. And I found it while reading up on calcium, so that's just something interesting to keep in mind. So yeah, too much thyroid hormone can lead to bone loss, which is probably why I found it in the calcium thing. So, you know, again, we've got the RDAs for a reason. Now, calcium gets stockpiled in your bones from an early age, then the amount slowly declines as you age. It's a good idea to have lots of calcium earlier on since you can't really stockpile any more in your bones after a certain period of time. So obviously there's not much you can do about this if you're a bit older, but I guess when you want to have kids and stuff, get them to stockpile, uh, get them to like have a lot of milk and then make sure you get your vitamin D3 and K2 with that as well. Because once, like the, the images I found here just tell the story like, you know, well enough, but... So basically, calcium is important early on, and it's also important later on because although you can't actually build up your calcium, uh, build up like your bone deposits any further, you can replace what is lost by calcium. Uh, you can have too much calcium too, but it's mostly due to calcium being deposited in your soft tissue, which happens because you didn't have enough vitamin K or too many supplements of calcium, which you don't get from food, which is not in this diet. Now, the calcium intakes in this diet are safe, so no need to worry. Now, there is some speculation that calcium reduces iron absorption. Now, this specific study I read up on that showed that calcium reduces iron absorption, the study was short-term and on a per-meal basis, so long-term reviews indicate there's no clear link between calcium hindering iron absorption, so... If you hear this somewhere, just disregard it. Like, you know, you might hear through the grapevine, oh, I don't have much calcium because it reduces your iron absorption. Yeah, bullshit. Now, choline. Now, choline supports lipid metabolism, which is energy from fats and liver, helps you, <laughs> helps you absorb more abuse from steroids. Uh, I guess. Don't know why I wrote that, but, you know, I'm going to leave that in. If you're deficient in choline, it can cause muscle damage, which is a fate far worse than death. Yeah, you can tell I was really starting to just have some fun here anyway. Now, it's debated whether choline is essential or not. Now, it's currently considered a conditionally essential nutrient. And choline is used... As, choline used to be considered essential, but since your body can produce this itself, it's not essential, but... I've included it anyway because I found in the fitness industry a lot of people tend to sort of mention this and it seems to be important amongst a lot of people. Which is funny because it's like, well, why is choline important? Why aren't you talking about every other nutrient? But yeah. Anyway. Choline is a technic it's technically a type of B vitamin. But that's just yeah, I guess just some more tidbits for you. It doesn't really play into much. Now I also read 90% of the US population don't consume enough choline despite the fact that we produce it. So if they need to consume choline despite the fact your body produces this, this is probably a testament to just how they're generally unhealthy anyway. 
But again, we get choline in this diet regardless. It's already included in eggs, which is, you know, one of the main foods in this diet. So it's not like we are including something specific just to hit choline and it may not be essential. Like, it's already there, is what I'm trying to say. Like, like it's choline's already part of the diet. Now, choline is also a backbone molecule for our brain cell membrane. So, you know, we want to get intelligent. This will help. So chloride. Chloride is important to help the muscles and the heart contract and to help our nerve cells carry messages, which are nerve impulses between the brain and the body. So this is just good for get well general health, but it also helps gym performance if you have your muscles contracting properly, hey. Now, I can't seem to find any definitive numbers for how much chloride is in seaweed, but I use a lot of salt so we'll get our chloride intake regardless so yeah i use iodized salt for the beef but again that's in the diet and you'll see it and the rda of this is 800 milligrams which if you just sort of sprinkle a bit of salt like you'll be fine with this intake so copper is up next now this is helpful for red blood cells which carry oxygen to the muscles which is more energy production which is more pbs at the gym it's also helpful for collagen which potentially can lead to more muscle growth and it helps you absorb iron too which will be mentioned which is like already mentioned in the iron section why we need that and it helps turn sugar into energy which is more energy for dim you know self-explanatory why we need this and the rda for copper is 1.6 milligrams which we hit no problem magnesium now this is used uh, for energy creation which is energy for gym it's used for protein formation, which is nutrition for gym. It's used for muscle movements, which is more force at the gym. And studies have shown that athletes perform better when having magnesium. But based on the above three points, that's pretty self-explanatory as to why that happened. Now, magnesium is also shown to help sleep. Now, I have no anecdote for this. Like, I like to speak... On my experience and what I've seen in like the facts but I don't have any anecdote to support magnesium helps sleep again I just use CBD gummies and before I found CBD gummies I was essentially like a uni student or a high school student so I didn't have much sleep in as much sleep as I'd like in high school but when you're a uni student you get a fair bit of sleep so and like you can kind of just sleep when you want so I had no anecdote for this but like, I also, I'm tired at the end of each and every day because I do so much in each day anyway. And I use CBD products, so I can't tell you if magnesium actually does help you sleep, but from what I've seen, it does. So if you're having trouble getting to sleep, you might want to up that magnesium intake, but just use CBD products. I need a CBD product sponsorship. Now, manganese. Now, this is used in the metabolism of amino acids, which is nutrition for muscle growth. Uh, it's helpful for cholesterol as well, which cholesterol increases testosterone production. Now, I must mention, testosterone production is not 100% correlated with muscle growth. There's some anecdotes I've seen and some studies to support the claim that cholesterol helps with their muscle growth. And it helps with carbohydrate manganese helps with carbohydrates as well which is self-explanatory more energy for gym so just really quickly on that testosterone thing basically higher testosterone does not exactly mean more muscle growth but this is more of a hormonal topic not a dietary topic which is outside the scope of this video eventually i'll start covering stuff like that and the rda for manganese is 2.3 milligrams we hit this no problem now molybdenum this mineral is more so a health mineral. Now, there may be indirect benefits for gym, as, I mean, most of them are if you're just generally healthy, but for the context of this video, this mineral isn't actually that important. And the maximum intake for this is 2 milligrams or 2,000 micrograms. We go nowhere near this, so we're fine. Sorry, molybdenum. I guess that's what you get for having a silly name. Now, phosphorus, this is helpful for how your body uses carbs and fats, which is nutrition partitioning. We all know why that's good. 
It also helps your body make protein for growth, so you build muscles with it. Helps your body make ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is energy for gym. I believe that's more of like a sort of explosive sort of energy. Like if you're going to run a marathon, it's not as helpful, but if you're doing like a sprint or like a 10 rep set or something at the gym, then this is, that's what ATP is helpful for. At least from memory from my cert for in fitness days. And phosphorus also helps with muscle contractions, which is more force at the gym. The RDA is 700 milligrams. We get this no problem. Now potassium, another one of my favorites. So potassium helps the body regulate fluid. It sends nerve signals and regulates muscle contractions. Now roughly 98% of the potassium in your body is found in your cells. And of this, 80% is found in your muscle cells. So therefore, potassium has a considerable influence on your gym performance. Now, the other 20% is found in your bones, liver, and red blood cells, which obviously will have a flow-on effect to gym performance. Now, once inside your body, it functions as an electrolyte. Now, when in water, an electrolyte dissolves into positive or negative ions that have the ability to conduct electricity. Now, potassium ions carry a positive charge. Your body uses this electricity to manage a variety of processes, including fluid balance, nerve signals, and muscle contraction. You know, nerve signals, muscle contraction, we know that helps you lift more at the gym. Now, the RDA of potassium is around 47 to 4,900 milligrams a day. Now, this is actually pretty difficult to get without actively trying for it. You have to, yeah, actively be trying and paying attention to hit this, in, hit this amount. Now, potassium works well in tandem with sodium to bring blood pressure down as potassium helps relax blood vessel walls because we'll get into why sodium is important. So yeah, what I just mentioned, potassium helps blood pressure in tandem with sodium and sodium has a wide range of benefits, but it can cause blood pressure to rise in some cases. We'll get to that when we get to the sodium part. But yeah, potass we hit potassium, the potassium RDA just fine, but it's unlikely most people are actually hitting the recommended intake of potassium. Selenium, Selena Gomez. Selenium is primarily for general health, but having a positive impact for thyroid, which will have a positive impact on your metabolism. So yeah, selenium is good for your thyroid health. Thyroid is good for your metabolism overall. And the RDA is around 55 micrograms. Say it with me, we get this just fine. Now, sulfur. Sulfur helps metabolize food, which is good for nutri nutrient partitioning. And it's good for the health of your tendons and ligaments, so you get less risk of an injury at the gym. More time in the gym training or training with less pain means you can train harder. The RDA, I have no idea, couldn't find anything, but we... um. We hit it regardless. I haven't seen anything to show that too much is unhealthy in terms of ingesting it from food. But if this is something you are concerned with, do your own research. But from what I've seen, we shall be right. She'll be right. Okie doke, sodium. So, optimal sodium intake increases blood volume, which helps deliver more oxygen and nutrients to the cells, which helps repair and remove waste materials. Sodium also helps increase stamina and endurance, and it allows athletes to hold more water in the muscles, which increases strength and explosiveness, as well as helping improve the integrity of the joint. Now, sodium isn't unhealthy, all right? So three of the largest studies ever done on sodium intake all show that an increase in salt results in a decrease in cardiovascular disease and all cause mortality, which is like, the general reasons for death, basically. Now, in fact, the highest rates of all-cause mortality were found in groups that restricted sodium intake. There is a small percentage of the population that is sodium sensitive. You know, the same way that people have peanut allergies and lactose intolerances, but everyone doesn't go around saying milk and nuts are terrible for you, hey. Now, research suggests it's a small percentage that has adverse effects from increasing their sodium intake. Now, 
When you initially increase your salt intake, you will realize some water retention until your body acclimates to the increased salt intake, but it will normalize in a couple of days. So this just reiterates some of what I just said, just this first paragraph, but sodium increases blood volume, which helps deliver more oxygen and nutrients to the cells, which helps repair and remove waste. So not only does it assist in recovery, but also improves gym performance. It also increases stamina and endurance, which is more sets or more reps in the gym, as well as allowing you to hold more water in your muscles, which will obviously help you with strength and explosiveness, and like your muscles are like 70% water anyway or something, so that's obviously a good thing. It can also help improve the integrity of the joints, which basically refers to the health of the joint, and obviously power lift movements three times a week isn't going to be kind on your joints, so this will help with that as well. That's specific to my powerlifter friend. It's like applicable to, I guess, anyone who goes to the gym, right? You don't want your joints to be unhealthy now, do you? Now, the RDA of sodium has changed over the years. Uh, it was a, it's sort of around 1,500 to 2,300 milligrams at the moment. Now, this recommendation is trash since the health organizations are still caught up in the past thinking that sodium is dangerous. Now, I mentioned before the small percentage of the population. I've seen the 15% figure somewhere, so we'll just roll with that. Around 15% of people are salt sensitive and should be wary of their sodium intake. But for the rest, sodium is nothing to be afraid of. So the human kidneys can filter around 30 grams or 30,000 milligrams of sodium per day. Now, this doesn't mean we should all aim for this. It's like saying the human body can withstand 45 degree weather. That doesn't mean we should just go and stand in 45 degree weather all the time, right? And also 30 grams of sodium is pretty fucking hard to get. So I would, I won't be advising anywhere near that anyway. You'd have to literally be like just drowning in salt for that to happen. Now this last line was a specific note to my powerlifter friend, but I think it's important to note anyway. Now, although we are going to track sodium from these tablets, like I, I gave him salt tablets to have, from these tablets to increase your sodium intake, just you can just get a teaspoon of iodized table salt and just down it, just take a shot of it. This will provide roughly 2,300 milligrams of sodium, like just real rough guideline, and do it approximately an hour before your workout if possible. If not, just take it whenever during the day. And the reason I told him to take it an hour before your workout is sometimes when you get exhausted through your workout, a lot of people think you're just dehydrated, but you might actually just be low on sodium. So just try this out for yourself. If you're getting um, really bummed out halfway through your workout, just try a shot of a shot of salt before your workout. See if it helps. And an RDA that I've seen that's a bit more appropriate is around 4,000 milligrams per half a gallon of water that you drink. So again, this is a recommendation from Stan Efforting. If you're feeling a little bit like, uh, I don't know about this, then feel free, do your own research. As I mentioned before, just because you saw it somewhere, don't take it and run with it. Take it, dissect it, do your own information, use it as a springboard to do your own research, then come to your own conclusion. But I have been having a bucket load of sodium for ages and I am healthy. But again, that's just me. Maybe you are one of those people that has an adverse reaction to an increase in sodium. So that's something you'll need to just have a look at yourself. So, A to zinc. We're at zinc now, the last mineral. Zinc has a number of tasks in the human body, but most notably, it assists the body in immune function, which is less sick days and bad workouts from the gym, and protein synthesis. Most breakfast cereals, like wheat bix don't naturally contain this element, so sometimes they'll be fortified with it. Now, while this isn't as good as it coming from a natural source, it's still going to be better getting some zinc than none. It's also a good, better, best scenario. So best scenario, zinc comes naturally. A better scenario is zinc is fortified into the product. A good scenario is you have some sort of zinc from a supplement. And bad scenario, you have no zinc at all. Zinc is also necessary for the activity of over 300 enzymes that aid in metabolism, which means you can diet on higher calories. Digestion. Now, we all know by now how important gut health is. Although I didn't actually mention it in this video, 
this is just something that I was mentioning to my mate. Basically, long story short, gut health is probably where a lot of the health from your body stems. This is a good thing to look into. Um, check out the benefits of gut health. And how do you get your gut healthy? By not eating so much shit that your gut can't handle. And zinc also helps nerve function, which is more power and output in the gym. Now, a lot of foods do have zinc, but I've only included a zinc count in foods that have a noteworthy amount of it in their nutrient profile. Same can be said for all the nutrients, like not... Most foods will contain a tiny amount of some other nutrient, but I haven't put it in because it's... Like, I haven't put it in if it's, like, such a small irrelevant amount. So, too much zinc can actually interfere with your absorption of copper and iron. But this is only if you have around 60 milligrams of zinc per day for 10 weeks, as the study that I read suggested. And we're nowhere near 60 milligrams, let alone 60 milligrams for 10 weeks straight. So here are just some extra tidbits. I didn't know where to throw this in the video, so I'll just chuck it here. So tuna. Um, tuna, as you may know, is a little bit high in mercury, and mercury is has been shown to be, like I guess, a little bit unhealthy. And albacore tuna is higher in mercury than others, and albacore tuna is usually what you find in cans, which is where I get my tuna from. Uh, now, from what I've seen, it's not something that is that you need to be too concerned with. If anyone knows any like good sources of information showing like dangerous mercury levels, then please let me know, but I couldn't actually find any. So I've had a can of tuna a day for a few months now, ever since I added it into my diet, and I haven't had any of these symptoms. So on the right you're seeing symptoms of so symptoms of like too much mercury and I haven't had any of them. So a five ounce serving or one can of tuna seems to contain around 49 or 49.53 micrograms of mercury. So five ounces is 142 grams here in Australia where we use the metric system. Uh, and that's roughly about the same size can that I have. I am about 84 kilos at the moment. So around 50 grams of mercury, 84 kilos divided by 50 equals 1.68. So apparently one one gram one milligram of mercury per kilo is like a sort of general upper range. It seems I'm a bit above this, but I don't know if that's actually the upper range or just a rough guideline. Um, again, I can't find any more info on the toxicity of mercury, so if anyone knows more info, please let me know, but I just could not find anything. And I find it extremely hard to believe that I'm going to die of poisoning because I'm eating too much tuna. Like, bodybuilders have eaten tuna for years and they've never had real, like, health problems other than steroid abuse. Again, I'm open to being proven wrong, but I couldn't really find anything. So, the reason I mention this is because, again, I'm justifying why I've put certain foods in this diet. And I know some people are concerned with my mercury from tuna, but... Yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't really found anything too that suggests it's like super dangerous. Like I'm having one can. It's not like I'm having a full fish. Like, yeah, yeah, just not a hundred percent sure. But something to keep in mind. If you're concerned, then feel free to axe the tuna. Now, eggs as well. Um, in this diet, we have six egg yolks, and that's our eggs. We don't filter the yolks out. You'll see why the yolks are super important, but the yolks can have a negative impact on your LDL cholesterol, but it's a small percentage of the population, which you'll have to find out via your own blood work. I will have no idea whether you'll react negatively to this. For me, my blood work didn't really show anything too bad. When I had my blood work done in the middle of 2020, the only thing that was like wrong was the doctor said my cholesterol was like getting a little bit high, but I was eating 5,500 calories a day and I was getting pretty fat. And I was also having like a full block of chocolate and like, like one and a half liters of milk at least a day, along with like, you know, the six eggs and stuff. But the point is I was having a lot of other foods 
that were high in cholesterol. Like, I don't believe the eggs specifically were what caused my higher cholesterol, but even then, he just said higher cholesterol, which, but like, you'll have to do your own blood work to check this. So we didn't track cholesterol intake in this diet because the amount of cholesterol you ingest does not correlate to your cholesterol levels. So the video I've shown there, um, Derek from More Plates, More Dates, or More Dishes, More Bishes, More Trend, More Men, said that, again, that's that Stan Efferding guy I spoke about before, excellent source of information, go watch his stuff. But the eggs impacted his LDL cholesterol levels. So I thought I mentioned that because it didn't impact mine, but like my cholesterol was up, but it wasn't like, like, like I said, it wasn't because of the eggs, it was because of just general, general amounts of chocolate and shit anyway. But again, this might impact your levels. So just check your blood work and see how the eggs are impacting you. So another thing with eggs is if the chickens are quote pasture raised, that just means they're raised in open field, free roaming, like at your home. So they have grass and other food scraps, not just the seeds they usually have. Again, I mentioned that in that recession is imminent video, but basically if you know someone who has homegrown chickens that they like let roam around the garden, they have some grass, they snack on some like food scraps, definitely get eggs from them as opposed to the supermarket because they will be, they will be healthier eggs. And I also found two separate sources that state 32 micrograms of vitamin K2 is in egg yolks. So that just is more evidence to support my figures that I've put in um, the diet. So protein powder, this is what I was talking about before with my mate's protein powder. Now, protein powders allegedly contain 8 to 20% of the RDA of calcium per scoop. This doesn't really matter since we're already well over the calcium intake. This is, again, his diet specifically. But I've calculated this for the lower end of the spectrum anyway. The micronutrients in protein powder isn't included in the overall diet since it varies between protein powders, but we need it to hit our protein intake. So that's specific to this diet. So without the protein powder, we don't hit like our rough 160 grams of protein. Again, if you need more, then have more protein food. If you don't need as much, you can probably cut out protein powder, for example. But that little image on the right, that's just what I found from this specific protein powder my friend used. So again, it just sort of bumps the overall vitamins and minerals up a bit, but we don't really need that in the context of this specific diet. So here is the elusive diet I've been alluding to this whole video. So, you can see the foods at the top, like the egg yolks, full cream milk, wheat bites, just right, etc. This is everything I'm having at the moment. And as you can see, as you go down, you can see all the vitamins, the minerals, and the omegas there. Everything in yellow is like, quote, essential, and everything in like, sort of that orangey brown color is, quote, like, non-essential. Now, the protein figures at the top, I've done a conditional format on Microsoft Excel. Basically, the greener it is, the closer we are to 20 grams of protein. So you'll note that for all those meals, we have them all separately. Like I'll put in um, the meals later, but basically in the morning, I'll have 100 grams of Just Right cereal with 300 mils of milk. For my tea break, for my work, I will have one can of tuna, a little mini packet of seaweed, and 100 grams of the Wheat Bites, which is a the, the, these are products here in Australia. I'm not sure if they have them anywhere else, but basically most of the nutrients come from the fact that they're whole grains. So just have some whole grain thing as a substitute if you can't find the specific cereal. And the specific cereal doesn't matter. It's just what I like to eat. The diet that's the best is the, per the actual perfect diet is the one you'll stick to. So, you know, but the point is the health benefits are from the fact that they're whole grains. Like I calculated the nutrients based on the percentage of like the food being whole grains. So for example, the wheat bites, I believe are like 64, 68% whole grains overall. So I just went on to nutrition data self, plugged in the figures for hundred grams, went through them all, added them in and then times them by 64%. And that's how I got the values here.
So yeah, the tea break, tuna, seaweed, the wheat bites, and then for lunch, have the beef sprinkled with iodized table salt and sweet potato and kiwi and dark chocolate. Before gym, I'll have the protein shake. Now, the reason I have this before gym and not after is because there's so much milk in like the protein powders that I have. And like, it's a, it's a decently long drive for me to get to work from my office job. Not so much my Woolworths job, but mainly my office job. It's such a long drive. It's not like I'm going to have something to eat while I'm driving. And I'm not going to eat food like right before I'm about to leave work. So I just have my protein shake on the way to the gym. And yeah, like, I mean, I have it before gym because otherwise I'd get hungry halfway through the workout. And if I have it after the workout, it's so late in the day and I've had all this fluid, I will inevitably wake up in the middle of the night to urinate. And whenever I do that, I am not guaranteed to go back to sleep. So I just stop that. So I have the protein shake on the way to the gym. And after the gym, I'll have my six eggs and spinach. And then as for like the vitamin D tablets, I'll have that with, uh, I'll have that after I have the eggs. Same with the omega-3 capsules and same with a shot of wheat germ oil if I need it. And I'll cook the pan with the butter. So that's basically how I eat them. I mean, you can eat them in whatever order you want. I guess the important part is to have the eggs and the spinach, the wheat germ oil and the D vitamin D3 and the omegas together and then have the beef sweet potato kiwi and dark chocolate together as well i guess the rest can sort of be spread out as as you want but those are the main things so in the columns with the food like for example look at the egg yolks column everything that's like if the cell is completely covered in blue that means we've hit the recommended intake for that nutrient just with that food itself but if the cell is like half colored or partially colored that indicates that we've only partially covered the recommended intake for that nutrient like for example butter the vitamin a in butter there's a little bit but there's not much so like it's not really close to the recommended intake which is why the cell is basically not fully covered if that makes sense so as you can see for egg yolks there is a lot of nutrients that we fully covered just with the egg yolks itself. Same with the milk, same with the beef, a little bit with the tuna, a little bit with the sweet potato. Funnily enough, the iodized table salt covers a couple of the other nutrients that we wouldn't get otherwise. But as you can see, for example, the vitamin D3 capsules, there's nothing else there that will cover vitamin D except for that. And same with the wheat germ oil for vitamin E. That's basically the only thing that covers vitamin E. So again, that's why we've included absolutely everything here. Like with the fish oil tablets, for example, that thing basically carries us to our recommended omega-3 intake. As mentioned again before in the video, we I don't have an omega-6 supplement yet, but once I add that in, that'll like properly complete the diet. If you look at the column surplus deficit, Basically, if it's in green, that means we're over, which usually is a good thing. And like, it's a good thing we're over in the calories, for example, because I'm bulking. And again, that's just a general guideline. Look, this is like my base diet. I will tack on some extra food if I want more calories. Like for example, sometimes I may have like another serving of wheat bites and some more milk. For example, if I need more calories. Or like, I may even, like, fuck it, I may even have a bit more, like, chocolate or something. But as long as I have this, basically, every day, like, except the weed germ oil, like, sometimes I'll, like, skip that. But basically, if I have most of this every day, I'm going to be pretty good. Um, anyway, so yeah, with that green column, that surplus deficit column, the one that's in green, if it's green, it means we're over. And the column next to it shows, like, how much we're over by a percentage amount. I've checked where like even if we're way over i've checked that to, i've checked to make sure it's not unhealthy so we're fine as you can see at the bottom we're not actually getting the recommended intake of omega sixes but again we'll supplement that later so yeah this is basically the quote perfect diet i'll bet you that you've never actually seen a diet that actually 
contains all this stuff. I had a friend, right, and she was like, she was participating in this pretty prestigious modeling event, and she had to like get fit for it, obviously. She paid this guy like a hundred bucks a week to do like this meal plan or online coaching or some shit. Basically, she was paying him a hundred bucks to, for him to write her program and then to sort of like vaguely DM her. It was like, I was like, holy shit, people paying this money, like, I could do a much better job and I wouldn't even charge that much. But anyway, I had a look and it didn't show, like, it just showed the basic, like, oh, breakfast had this, lunch had this, dinner had this. No micronutrients, which, like, I get it. Most diets don't have it. They should, but they don't. But what's worse was I was eyeballing it and I could tell there was a few nutrients that she wasn't getting. Like, she wasn't getting iodine. I know that. She wasn't getting vitamin E or D because she wasn't getting enough sunlight. And I know for a fact, based on, like, the lack of, like, eggs and meat, she wasn't getting enough things like iron and zinc as well. And I was like, holy crap. Like, goddamn, I should have gone into nutrition, not accounting. Um, but yeah, so basically this is like just a good base of like a quote perfect diet. And it's also a good springboard for you to sort of do your own research, I guess. Like maybe you never thought about getting in all your vitamins and minerals. Like I know a lot of people say, oh, eat your fruits and veggies. It's good for you. Like, well, why is it good for you? Well, because it contains vitamins and minerals. Well, which vitamins and minerals and why like why does that help me like oh i'm not getting enough zinc or what is zinc to well hopefully this video has helped open your eyes to that so here's just a little snippet of like food combinations so i eat these foods in combination with each other anyway like it's just it just so happens that that's how i ate them and the the primary reason was to like enhance nutrient absorption like i would normally never have kiwi alongside like my beef and sweet potato like i don't mix it together i eat my beef with my sweet potato you know alternate between the two containers and then i'll have my kiwi after it but it's all in the same meal but normally i would have the kiwi as like a snack or something later but anyway these are the these are the main sort of reasons i combine these certain foods there could be other vitamin and mineral combinations that work well in tandem with each other but i didn't really find any but again if there are then obviously just combine foods in the same meal that that complement each other so phosphorus and b vitamins for example they work well together but you literally just get this through eggs so you're not going to split your egg meal up because you're eating eggs as one food so you know that's fine um phosphorus and b vitamins there is phosphorus and b vitamins in like tuna and wheat bites so for example me personally i just have tuna and wheat bites in my tea in my work break this wasn't like intentional to com to combine phosphorus and b vitamins it just so happens that this is just how i had them so again these are just some good meal combinations even though i kind of just went through them so that's basically a rundown of every single vitamin and mineral that you probably haven't thought about with your diet that's fine. I never really thought about it in my first several years of going to the gym anyway. Now, I have these because, I mean, obviously not only does it help gym performance, but it just helps me generally stay healthy. Now, if you know anything about me, you know I'm pretty much on that grind 24-7. I don't really have the room to get sick and I need to sort of keep going. Some people are like, aren't you tired? Aren't you burnt out? No. No, uh, obviously sometimes I get a bit tired if you haven't had enough sleep, but you know, aren't we all perpetually tired anyway? And a lot of that is because I try to get as much sleep as I can, but it's also this diet. Like if you're feeling sick, like often chances are you're lacking in one of these vitamins and minerals. And I make sure I get most of them every day, except for the poor vitamin E, but you know, again, fat soluble stays in your system a bit longer. So I'm probably right to skip out on it a little bit. But you probably don't need to hit all of these just to, if you want to become super ripped. So I was at my most ripped in like 2017, 2018, 2019 when I was at uni, right? And I don't, like, I never actually actively track this stuff. I may have accidentally hit some of these nutrients. Like, for example, most bodybuilders or gym rats have eggs. Like you can accidentally hit a lot of your nutrients just by having eggs, you know what I mean? 
so you don't need to track to hit all these if you want to become super shredded but if you're if you have more to your life than just gym if you i don't know are studying almost a master's level if you're working full time for example if you're working like i don't know seven days a week and you're uh, at the gym four to five nights a week and you've got a couple of side hustles you're trying to get off the ground and you're studying basically an above uni level above university level of education and you're keeping up to date with the whole stock market and investing like mm, like me for example you're gonna have to stay pretty healthy around the clock so this diet will definitely help you out with that now alternatively you could just pick other foods that help you hit every vitamin and mineral i just mentioned like these aren't the only foods that will help you hit all of them this is just what i'm having and what i enjoy although i will have to say without red meat without eggs without milk without vitamin d uh, capsules without wheat germ oil and without seaweed or iodized salt you're probably going to have trouble hitting a lot of these nutrients so that's just my suggestion not advice just a suggestion feel free to copy this you know but ultimately it's not advice you'll have to sort of do your own research if you're having some sort of troubles now if you want this excel doc or this powerpoint slide or both whatever i don't care i what was happening in the past was when people wanted excel docs from me they i would put them on google drive and then people would have to like go to the link and just download it from there the problem is google drive has been playing up lately and it's like sort of i guess shutting people out i think i got an email request the other week of someone trying to gain access to it and i was like why i didn't put a password on this like why do i need to give someone access they should be able to just click on the link and get it so to say that hassle if you want this stuff just shoot me an email or like i guess a dm on instagram one or the other but there's no such thing as a free lunch you're gonna have to do something for me just send me a screenshot of you having liked this video as well as like following the instagram accounts for both gamification of life and gainsification as well as sub to the gainsification channel because eventually in the future i'll just post like real short gym clips there I don't want to have to spam gamification of life's channel with like small little like minute tidbits of gym stuff so just send me a screenshot of you you liked this video and subbed to this channel you subbed to gamification channel you follow gamification instagram and gamification of life instagram and then i will reply with these two documents and that way you can just follow it yourself and you can have all this info too so anyways i hope this video has helped you out and i'm sure you've learned something from this well hopefully you've learned something from this because this took me a while to make and hopefully it'll help you in your grind obviously not only with gym but just general health and it'll help you get more work done anyways that is all